what's good, Magnolia students? I hope you're doing well. It's Pastor RJ here, and I want to share with you some thoughts on Ephesians chapter 2. As this week, we're talking about God's grace. Yes, God's grace. And what does God's grace stand for? Well, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. So you take the word grace, you can see that it spells out something that help us remember what grace is all about. Grace is getting something we don't deserve. It's when someone shows us tremendous compassion and forgiveness and love. So when somebody blesses us with something that we don't deserve. And I know for you and for me, as students, we have gone through many situations where we should have gotten something else instead of grace. And so think about that in your life real quick. A lot of situations in your life, you've been shown a lot of grace. And it's so important for us to recognize that because we see how much grace God has actually given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul wants us to understand in Ephesians. From death to life means that you have been saved by grace. You don't deserve it, but because Jesus loves you so much, He was willing to die on the cross for your sin to give you eternal life. God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense is a great way to remember how His unmerited favor is always towards those who believe in Him. And that was always His plan. Remember Ephesians chapter 1? We talked about God's plan with our memory verse, and it talked about how He worked everything together to the counsel of His will for His purpose. So everything has a purpose, and it's based upon His grace, that He is a gracious God, a loving God. It tells us this in Exodus chapter 34, verse 8, when God redoes the covenant. He redoes the covenant with uh, Israel, and if they redo this, they uh, Moses goes up on the mountain, gets the Ten Commandments again, comes back down. He once got them and then came down and broke them because they were sinning and they are in idolatry and they are worshiping the golden calf in Exodus 32. And then Moses pleads and intercedes for his people and God listens to him and he ends up renewing the covenant and he comes back down and he tells them, who are you God? And he says, this is who I am and I'm a God who is gracious and compassionate and forgiving sin from generation to generation. So it's incredible how good our God is, and so many people miss it, and it's quite possibly that many were missing it in Ephesus. And so Paul was reminding them about the gospel and how it's a gospel of grace. It's good news, and Jesus came for us even when we didn't deserve it. So grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, a great way to remember it, because Jesus teaches us how to live differently, and He showed us grace. He came in grace and truth, it says in John 1.18. Jesus came with all the truth to fulfill all the scripture, but he came with grace because he came in a way that fulfilled the word of God and displayed the character of God. So you want to see what God looks like? Look at Jesus. And so Paul wants to help us understand the gospel and how it changes our lives to make us more like Jesus and less like the world. So there's a few things I want to point out to you in Ephesians chapter 2 about God's grace so that way you can go a little deeper this week in our series, From Death to Life. I want to share with you five things that God does through His grace that the Apostle Paul lays out for us in Ephesians chapter 2. Number one is that God's grace saves us from worldly decisions. Look at verse 1. In verse 1 it tells us, that the people that were living in Ephesus were dead in their trespasses and sins in which they once walked, falling in the course of this world, and they're falling in the prince and power of the air, it says in verse 2. Verse 1, they were dead in their sins and their trespasses. They're law-breaking. They broke God's commandments. They broke God's laws. And so therefore, they were like, well, like, we're doomed. Like, what can we do, right? And Jesus comes to forgive us of those things. And so we're all dead in our sins. And he said, you didn't know God. You didn't have a relationship with God. And you were dead in your sins because you were following the course of this world, or rather the ways of this world, the teaching of this world. You were under the influence of the world. And so it says that you were following the prince and power of the air, the spirit that is is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So what this is saying is that there is worldly people out there and they think worldly about their decisions in life. And so they make bad decisions. They make decisions based on the course of the world, the the ways of the world, the thinking of the world, doing things the way that the world or the culture says so. So God's grace saves us from these worldly decisions we once walked in and helps us make good decisions, godly decisions, righteous decisions, pure decisions. So this is why it's so important to know about God's grace, because it helps us with our decision making. Second thing is, is that God's grace saves us from ungodly influences. 
So you notice here it says the prince and power of the air. It's talking about the enemy. And the enemy is an influencer for wrong. He influences people to disobey. It says in verse 2 that they're, they're, work at, they're in the work of the sons of disobedience. Meaning there's people that are all around disobeying God. And the enemy is tempting them and leading them astray. And influencing them to do the wrong things. See, the Bible tells us that sin is pleasure for a season, for a reason. Because it's easy to commit it. And it's actually kind of fun because we give into the secrecy or we give into the darkness or we give into the hate or we give into the flesh. And if it wasn't pleasurable, we would never do it. And the enemy wants to trap you in that. Because what ends up happening is you end up giving this pleasure temporary, but you end up having dissatisfaction forever. And it never satisfies in the end. And from one who was once like this and walking this way and was dead in my trespasses in high school and didn't know how to live for God and didn't know God and was following the course of this world, I was under the influence of a lot of bad people, a lot of people who were thinking the wrong things. They were in a lot of disobedience to God and so that led to my disobedience towards God. So you need to think right now about your student friends and about your life and what you want to do. And is it going to glorify God or is it going to glorify the world? So the second thing is that God's grace saves us from ungodly influences. And when God's grace comes into our life, we once were dead and then we're made alive. Our whole life changes and now our influencers change. We start listening to the right music. We start watching the right type of movie content and downloading the right kind of media. We start to obey what Jesus says and honor those that are above us so we don't disobey authority and reject those that are above us in our home or at school or at church or in the community. We start to listen instead of fight because that's in the end why we disobey. We're fighting against God's commandments. We're fighting against God's plans. We're fighting against God's will because we want to do it our way. And so when you're in your sins, It takes a lot to admit that you're wrong. So Paul here is trying to say, this is who you were. If you didn't know Jesus, you were dead in your sins and you were following the course of this world and you were making ungodly decisions and you were under the influence of the enemy and many others in the culture because they were teaching you to disobey. So God's grace saves us from these ungodly influences and he makes us alive and helps us to see the light and to do things that are right for our lives. And so many students struggle with their life because they don't live with grace. They live with legalism. Well, if I don't do this, then all of a sudden my life's not good. And if I don't do this, then all of a sudden my life's not great. And if I don't do this, then people won't like me. And if I don't do this, then God won't help me or bless me. No, it's about God's grace and leaning in to his promises and trusting where he where he's taking us and that you won't be in this world but that way you would be not of this world and live like jesus be more like him so paul describes what it looks like not to have jesus and he goes on even further the third thing that god's grace does is that god's grace saves us from rebellious attitudes in verse 3 it tells us about rebellious attitudes and this reminds me of when i was a student says among whom we all once lived in passions of our flesh carrying out the desire of the body and the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And so he's just saying, we were doing whatever we felt like. We gave into our flesh, we said what we felt, and we acted how we wanted to without consequence. And if we got in trouble, so what? We didn't agree with it, and so we just went on our way. And so many times we struggle in life because we don't listen to those that are above us, but let alone, we just go astray and just do whatever we feel like. That's actually a bad thing. Because then you're basing your life off of subjective things. Because your feelings can change. So that means your behaviors can change. And so if we base our life off objectivity, truth, then our behaviors will be based off that. And our behaviors will try to be better and more grounded in a reality that isn't emotional. And isn't all over the place. So Paul is saying, if you didn't know Jesus, you're dead in your sins. And you're going crazy in the way that you're living because you're doing it your way instead of God's way. So there's no hope. What do we do? Verse four comes in and verse four says, but God, right? But God, rich in mercy. We talked about this in our previous video about how amazing this miracle is that God stepped in and saved us that while Christ you know, died on the cross, we were enemies of the cross and he came to rescue us anyway because he loves us so much. But while we were enemies, he still came and died for the ungodly. I love that passage and what God teaches us in Romans chapter five. 
about how we don't deserve any of this, but Jesus came to make things right so we could have a right relationship with him because he loves us so much. The first Adam brought sin into the whole world and all of us are sinful and fallen. But the second Adam, Jesus Christ, the God man came and reversed the curse and has now given us hope. We once were dead, but now we can be made alive. And it continues in verse four, that because of his great love in which he loved us, even which we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, verse five, by grace you have been saved. Amen to that. See, the fourth thing you need to know is that God's grace saves us from this division that would come because he's rescued us from these really sinful, rebellious attitudes where we war against each other, we argue with one another, we debate one another, we fight one another, and we do the same with God. And then we finally humble ourselves and say, God, you know more. God, you know best. God, you are in control and I want to trust you. You have a plan for my life. You have given me life. And I was created on purpose for a purpose. You see, you were created on purpose for a purpose. And so God's grace created you as a purpose to glorify him and to enjoy everything that he's made. By God's grace, he created you and given you everything that you have. And because of everything that you have, it is our right response to give him the glory. And it's no excuse for Paul to get away with this in his life because he wasn't giving glory to God. And then he ended up meeting Jesus. And then that's all he did with the rest of his life was give glory to God. But God. And so Paul even sees himself in the first few verses here of who he was as he was dead in his sins. And now he's been made alive in Christ by grace. So God's grace saves us from division because now from verse 5 all the way to the end of the chapter, we learn about how God's grace saves us from ourselves so we don't boast in any works that we do. That God's grace saves us from ourselves so that way we don't think we're better than other people. God's grace saves us from ourselves, that we thought that we didn't have access to God, but now we do have access to God through Christ. So we didn't get access on our own merits, but on Christ's merits, He gave us that access. And then on top of all of that, now we can become one. We receive this new family. Because of God's grace, we now are united with other believers, with one another, and we can have this unity that the world is longing for. And right now, as the world is longing for it, and we see some of it with the COVID-19 crisis and everyone's coming together and saying, we're in this together, there's a lot of people that aren't. And so the glimpses of unity that we see are good, but it's not global unity and it's not global unity and local unity all together at the same time, yet everyone's going through the same thing right now. The church is actually the voice of unity. And so Paul says, God's grace saves us from division and it's the division, the separation we have between God and man. Christ came and reconciled that so we could have our friendship with God restored because our friendship's been broken from day one because of sin. So God came to restore our friendship and to make us in a right relationship through His Son, Jesus Christ. And then from one another to each other. So we're supposed to love one another as God loves us. We're supposed to forgive one another as Christ forgives us, right? We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so Paul will lay out here the rest of chapter 4, all about how to put on the old, or take off the old self and put on the new self in Ephesians. And so here in chapter 2, he's saying your theology, what you believe about yourself, about church, about God matters because it, it actually gives you a position from where you're going to live your life if you're going to be a divisive person. If you're going to live only with the people you like, if you're only going to serve the people that look like you, talk like you, act like you, if you're only going to cater to a certain gender, if you're only going to cater to a certain country, but God says all can be saved and all can be reconciled and all are united as one in Christ. And so Jesus reveals this, reveals this to us in the book of Revelation that all things will be made new and everyone, all tribes, tongues, and nations will be brought together in the kingdom. And so that kingdom is here on earth and one day it will be, it will be manifested when everybody comes back. When Jesus comes back and all those who are saved in Christ come back and this glorious resurrection happens where all the church is united once and for all. And when that happens, we'll see everyone who has been in Christ and how we're all united together.
and how humanity was always supposed to see, how humanity was always supposed to feel, and how humanity was always supposed to look like, that we'd be united with one another. So on Paul's day, major division in Ephesus. In our day, major division in our country and in our world when it comes to politics and race and gender and, and, and equality. There's all kinds of things happening, right? And even when it comes to us as young people, like we're looked down upon because we're young, we have to re remember God's promise that His grace saves us from division. And several of those divisions were later in chapter 2. It tells us that in chapter 2, verses 11 through 16, that there was a separation because in the Old Testament, there was a separation. In the temple, you would have the Jewish people worshiping and be separated in one place and Gentiles and non-Jewish people in another place. And they wouldn't be able to see each other and they wouldn't be able to do things with each other. And so they were, they were like in a box and they couldn't get across those lines. And the punishment was death. In fact, they accused the Apostle Paul of this because in Acts 21, he actually says that Gentiles can come into the place of worship because Jesus came to bring the gospel message to all people, including the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world. That's why the gospel is first for the Jew and the Greek, because Jesus was Jewish and brought the promises of God to light and fulfilled them, but also extended it to the whole world, to all nations. And so Paul's saying, you guys need to be one in Ephesus instead of being divided. God's grace saves us from division. And there's so much division in our world right now. What a message we need. We all need God's grace. We need to repent and turn from our sins and be made alive in Christ and be transformed so we can live with unity with one another. Because as a Christian, it's easier to love your neighbors as yourself because you have the love of God in you. When you're not a Christian as a teenager, it's harder to love your neighbor as yourself because the love of God is not in you. And that's why it tells us in 1 John chapter 2, don't love the things of this world, but you need to love the things of God. And that will help you in your journey. Also, the Apostle Paul tells us that there's division amongst people who are local and people who are strangers, people that are known and people who are unknown. And that Christ came for all those people and to make them known is to be known by God and then to make God known to everyone. So our mission isn't to celebrate ourselves or to isolate ourselves. It's instead to celebrate God and to infiltrate the wor world with the message of hope. That's what we have to do as students right now is get on our Instagram, get on our social media and tell the world about Jesus and how he gives us hope, how he gives us unity over division. God's grace saves us from division. And the fifth thing I wanted to share with you is that God's grace saves us from being left alone. And at the very end, of chapter 2, we have a few verses the Apostle Paul closes with, and he talks about people being far from God and near from God. It says in verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. He's talking about the Jew and the Greek. He's talking about all people, those that knew God and those that didn't know the God of the Old Testament. And he says, For though him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. There's only one way to heaven. Verse 19, so you are no longer strangers or aliens and have to go through different means, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God and built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the word of God, the teachings in the Bible, the books of the Bible, that Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone in which everything is built on. In verse 21, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows in a holy temple in the Lord, and in him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So what this means is that God is doing something in your life. God's grace saves us from being left alone and thinking that we don't belong to somebody, that we don't belong to something. But instead, in Christ, we belong to everything. Man, God has so much for you when you give your life to Christ. And as a teenager, that's important because our times change so fast. And it feels like we're hanging out with these friends and then they're no longer our friends. And then we're hanging out with these people and then we're no longer hanging out with those people. We end up changing classes and it feels like we don't know anyone. We end up changing teams and we end up feeling like we lost our relationships with our coaches and our players. Things happen and life changes quickly when we're young. But here's the good news is that in Christ, we know that God is with us and he's working in us to do something great. And this all built, all these building language all this uh, you know, construction language that the Apostle Paul is sharing right now at the end of the chapter, he's saying we build our life on Jesus Christ because we are his workmanship. It all ties back to chapter 2, verse 10. 
so that we are his workmanship, created for good works in Christ Jesus that were prepared beforehand. You know what that means? Is that God has a plan for your life and he has opportunities right in front of you to do great things for him. All you have to do is say yes. It's not about your ability, it's about your availability. You see, your abilities will take you so far, but your availability will take you further because you'll have time. And I think that's one of the things we're learning right now is that we have time for God finally. We have time for Jesus. We have time for the Bible because school was so busy and it dominated our life and we drifted away from Jesus. So in the very beginning of chapter two, it shows us who we are in the world, that we're dead in our sins, we're following the course of this world, we're listening to the, God, the ungodly uh, influences, um, we're not paying attention, we have bad and rebellious attitudes, but God, He shows up and changes our life and He makes us alive by His grace alone. And so we believe in faith in the gospel and His grace changes our hearts, changes our lives, and our attitudes become different. And now we don't boast in ourselves, we boast in Jesus Christ our Lord, and we become His workmanship. When people see us, they see God working in us. And when we are working, we are doing God's business on earth. And that's what He wants you to do as a teenager. You don't have to wait to become an adult. You can do it today. So what can you do to be God's workmanship, to be God's poetry in motion, to be God's writers or artists or musicians? Be those people that are going to communicate God's truth. Be His hands and feet. That's what you have to be praying about because God's grace leads us to greatness. In chapter 1, the glory of God is mentioned three times. It's mentioned in chapter 1, verse 6, verse 12, and verse 14, right? However, it says it's a glorious grace in verse six. And so 11 more times throughout the book of Ephesians, God's grace is mentioned. So 12 times God's grace is mentioned throughout the entire book of Ephesians. And one of the times he mentions it, he talks about it as a glorious grace. This means it's a grace that's triumphant, a grace that's victorious, a grace that's empowering, a grace that is strong, a grace that is something we could never compare it to, to anything else in our life. Because God's grace saves us and changes us. And so you have to ask yourself, has God's grace changed your life? Because we can't keep our salvation or earn our salvation. Jesus gives it to us freely and we receive it when he calls us through the gospel. He calls out to you and asks you as a student to get right with him. And he may be doing that right now. And so as we close, I want to end with this acronym for ALIVE. Because in this passage, Paul says you're being made alive in Christ. You once were dead, but now you're made alive by His grace. You were saved by His grace, and now you can live for God. Because before, you couldn't live for God, but now you do live for God. And so here's the words that I want to share with you regarding the letters A-L-I-V-E. A, for the word alive, avoid the world. Avoid the world. This is the first mark, according to Ephesians 2, that shows us that God's grace is working in our lives. We avoid the world. We don't give in to the things of this world. We don't give in to the temptations that are out there. Second thing is, is that we live for truth. Or later in the book, you're going to learn about how to live for truth in chapter 4, 5, and 6 as Paul kind of gives us the application. What do we need to do with our neighbors? What do we need to do with our world? What do we need to do personally and individually in our lives? What do we need to do at church? What do we need to do with other believers? He gives us all the instructions that we need, but he says in chapter four, verse 21, that the truth is in Jesus in which you've been taught. So we have to live according to truth, not error. That's the second mark of God's grace changing your life and making you alive. I invite others to Christ. Because you once were dead and now you're made alive, God is working in you and he's doing great things. And so you wanna share that good news. You wanna share what he's doing in your life. And so this is a great mark showing that we are saved and that we are different because now we're not sharing our life and platforming our, our performance and saying, look at me, look at me, right? Instead, we're like, look at God, look at God. God is on the throne in my life and he is Lord of my life. And I wanna invite you to know him. And when we start inviting people through a text, through uh, Instagram, um, through Snapchat, through social media. When we start telling them about God and we start seeing that in our life, it's because God's grace has changed us on the inside and now it's coming out and we're able to invite others. This is one of the marks of being invited to church, 
by a non uh, from a, a non-believing standpoint. It's like, why would you invite me to church? Because of God's grace. That was my story when my friend invited me. He experienced God's grace and he wouldn't stop until I went. And then I finally went and I said, that's it. I'm not going anymore. I'm just going to go this one time to get out of the way, not knowing that that would change my life forever. And then the next week I went to church and I gave my life to Christ. God's grace is powerful and we need to invite others to Christ if we're made alive. Another mark for V, vessel of honor. Notice there's no division in a vessel of honor. It does what it's intended to do. It accomplishes its intended purpose. And so we have to look around at our lives and really question, are we vessels of honor? There's so many people that are vessels of dishonor, guys. And we have to consider our lives in the long run. What we do in our teens will affect our 20s. Are we being vessels of honor and honoring our parents and building bridges so we can share the gospel with our friends and show the love of Jesus with our friends and make a difference in our country? I think this is a very powerful movement um, in youth groups when people are vessels of honor and step up and serve and make a difference. And lastly, in the word alive is the E. The fifth thing, an eternal perspective. And right now we need an internal perspective with COVID-19 going on. It's so easy to get caught up in this right here, all the crazy that's going on. This too shall pass. These things will change. We'll go back to normal. Not everything will be the same, but we'll go back to how life was. But it's gonna take some time. But an eternal perspective teaches us to see the big picture and to see that God is in control and that God has a plan and he's gonna see you through it. So trust in God's grace and he's going to help you through this time. So I pray this was an encouragement to you. Make sure to check out our videos. We drop them every week. And to see all the other videos that we have uploaded onto our YouTube channel, we pray that you'll continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ as we continue our series, From Death to Life, in the book of Ephesians. God bless you guys.